Welcome to Milkshake Monday, episode 46. I am Anita Helm. I'm the wife of Pastor William Helm of the Resurrection Baptist Church. I wanted to say to all of those who prayed for us for our Ark Encounter, we had a wonderful time. It was safe. It was fun. And I just pray to God that many of you have the opportunity to go visit Kentucky and see the awesome experience of seeing the replica of the Ark out of Genesis 8. Tonight is going to be very personal. And it's going to be personal enough that for those who don't know Jesus Christ and know him as your personal Lord and Savior, and just kind of know of him, you know about him, you know a little bit about God. I saw somebody's crazy Facebook post to say, oh, he's a fictional character. For those of you who don't know who Christ is, I don't know if you really want to listen tonight because this is for those saints of God who have trust God and believe his word and trust his spirit to be their comforter. And I'm talking about when you go through some hot tears. And those of you who have ever cried before, if you lived even a baby's life, you've cried before. And there are times where you just cry like the regular, washing of the eyes. But there are times where the emotions well up so much that it gets hot. And in those times, whether you are a parent, if you're a caregiver, your spouse, your friend, your neighbor, whatever's going on in your life that your emotions are so powerful that your eyes and your bodies react to the fact that something's going on on the inside that it has to pour out of you. I just want you to listen tonight. And I want you to take special note of the word forever. We talked last week about are you at the end of your life or at the beginning of your life? And I emphasize the word forever and the fact that God is forever. And I want to start where I left off last week when I talked about Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 4 because when you're going through those emotional times whether you're a caregiver or whoever you are but especially those of you who are caring for people your children, your spouses, your grandchildren, your friends, your family, whatever's going on in your life. I've been there. I am there. And God just spoke to me in my heart when I was going through one of those moments where I was just crying. And I was like, what is going on? And I said, it's not just regular tears. They're hot. And God just settled me down and told me some things. And one of the things he told me I'm going to share with you tonight. That's why I said it is personal. It's personal for me. It's personal for the Lord that I serve and that we serve together as saints of God. So I want to remind you about Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 14 because that foreverness of God, that forever that he's there for us, I want us to keep remembering like a kid learning their name, learning their, their social security, learning their address. you got to keep repeating the word of God because when Satan comes at you, you have to repeat back to him the word of God. Not how you feel, what you think, but the word of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 14 says, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. I'm just going to read that part. Whatever God does, it will be forever. And I want you to talk or see what the forever God and Jesus Christ talking to his father when he went through the most excruciating time on the actual cross during his resurrection. I want you to hear his words and understand that all of us are going through some things, but none of us are going through what he went through, where his very creator, created beings that he came to die for were putting him to death. And I want you to hear that conversation of who and how he's talking to his father. Verse 14 in chapter 22, or excuse me, a book 22 of Psalms says, For I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. Oh, my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. 
you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor poured the affliction of the afflicted, nor has, his hidden, has he hidden his face from him. But listen to this. But when he cried, talking Jesus to his father, but when he cried to him, he heard. And I want you to jump over to the verse that says 26. It says, the poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. We just heard in Ecclesiastes 3.14, forever. We're hearing Jesus talk about the Lord being his strength, the Lord hearing him, him crying out to him, his father, and his father hearing him, and him saying at the very, that's not even it, it says, let your heart live forever. Well, the night that I was crying, and it came upon me, I, I must have been thinking about things that were on my heart and mind, maybe going through some doubt, some concern, some being overwhelmed, some fear, all of those things happen. And sometimes you can control them and say, oh, I'm gonna be a great warrior. I'm gonna put on a whole armor of God. I'm gonna be so strong. And there are times where you let your guard down and those emotions come. And I asked the Lord while I was going through it, and I said, God, where can I find in the scripture where you were the caregiver? And God just spoke to my heart this handful of words out of Psalm 23. And he said it, and it just settled me down. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I didn't even get to the part about I shall not want. God just said in my spirit, I am your shepherd, Anita. I am your shepherd, saint of God. And as a shepherd, we recognize that he is our protector. He's our provider. He's the one that tells the sheep, you need to get some rest. He tells the sheep, I got you. I'm going to protect you. When the wolf comes, I'm going to be the one to fend off the wolf. He's going to say, when you're tired, rest, and I'm going to restore you. He's going to tell you, I'm going to prepare that table in the presence of your enemy. All of his power, all of the things that God has, he's telling us as his sheep, I got you. Yeah, I see you crying. I see you worrying. I see you having doubt. I see you have all this pressure. This situation comes, that situation comes. You were in one, now you're in another, now you're rolling into another. And God says, I got you. And that word that spoke to my heart was something and I said, I wanted to share with others. I just didn't want to hear from myself because I know it's so many others. I remember being in a relationship with an addict and I remember going through that and I was saying, where are the books about this? How am I supposed to deal with this? Where are the meetings for me? And I'd find a meeting and I said, I got a kid to take care of. I can't go to that meeting. I don't have time. I got to work. All this stuff was like spinning out of control. And I said, there's going to come a day where I can share with others, men, women, boys, and girls, that God is with you in the midst of your turmoil, your storm, whatever that trial is. The Lord's word says, the Lord is my shepherd. And that's just not Anita's shepherd. That's not just Rev's shepherd or Faith's shepherd. That's all of ours who believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is our personal Lord and Savior. It's not a game of, oh, we're going to church and putting on for other people to see. We know that in the midst of our circumstance, God is right there. But I want to show you something. I'm going to repeat something that I said last week because repetition will help you remember when Satan comes to hit you over the top of your head. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Again, I want you to see Ecclesiastes 3.14 talked about forever. And how the Lord, he is, he's just forever. And what he has for us and his truth and his peace and his mercy and his grace is forever. And his son knew that even on the cross, as he talks about the horrific things that he was going through, he knew his daddy was right there. I call him daddy because we're going to call him father. We're going to say Abba father. He's our father. But I want you to see how personal it is. Not only is he our shepherd, our shepherd, my shepherd, your shepherd who believe in Christ. He's also our father. But look what Matthew 6 verse 8 says. And I want you to slow down and hear what God is saying to each and every one of us. Now in the good times and even in those times where our tears are hot. And our emotions are over the top. Verse 8 says, for your father. Look at that personal. For your father. 
it says, knows the things. Notice that things is plural. It says, for your father knows the things you have need of. Not what you want, but what you need. He said he knows the things, plural. You may only think of one thing, but God says, his, as a father, he knows the things you have need of. And this is a clicker. Before you ask him, he still needs you to ask him, but he says, before you ask him, he knows the things you have need of. And Christ talks in the disciples' prayer of our father. Start off knowing that he's our father. Start our understanding. But I want you to see, again, this forever. We take for granted the word of God because we think we know everything that we need to know in this life. And if you don't know him, who is the Savior, who's the author and finisher of our faith, you don't know what you need to know before you go to the forever, forever, forever. But look what the last verse of the Lord's Prayer says in verse 13. It says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen means so be it, forever. This word forever is not there for accidental purposes. It's for us to understand that yes, there are gonna be some hard times in this natural life, but God says he's your shepherd. He says he already knows what things you have need of. He knows the battles that you're getting ready to go through. He knows what you're in for. But he says, I haven't left you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Never, never, never leave you or forsake you. Your homie or your homie can't say that. Your spouse can't say that. Your mom and daddy can't say that. Your kids can't say that. Your friends and neighbors can't say that. Your coworkers can't say that. But the Lord says, I will never leave you or forsake you. We're going to spend the rest of the time in Romans 8 because Romans 8 is so great. I mean... There are scriptures in Romans 8 that you need to put on your mirror in your room. You need to put it on your refrigerator, on your bathroom, everywhere. You have so much good meat in here. We've talked about the Father, our Father. The Father knows what you have need of. We talked about the shepherd. We're going to Jesus Christ. We talked about Jesus. We talked about the Father. We need to talk about the Spirit of God because sometimes I believe we just overlook the Spirit. Even though we know that Christ says when he's going, he says, I'm going to send the Comforter. The Comforter is there for all of us. And he's there for us individually and us collectively as the body of Christ. But we just oh, ain't got time. And we get, oh, that small, still voice. I'm not going to listen to him. And he said, no, listen. Because that spirit of God is talking to our spirit. But look what it says. I want you to jump in Romans chapter 8. We're going to go to verse 11. And listen. And I pray that you go back and read the scriptures for yourself. It says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now, the spirit is capitalized. So if you don't understand what it's saying, the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Don't discount the Holy Spirit. He's powerful in your life. When those hot tears come, the Spirit is there to comfort you. But it says, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. That body that's tired, that back that hurts, those tears that are coming out of that body, the frustrations, the fatigue, the illnesses, all those things that are happening to the mortal body. That's the now body. It's not the glorified body that we're going to have when we get to the forever of the eternity. But for this mortal body now, it's telling you the spirit is very important. It says here, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live, this is, you got to pay attention because all, every, all of us are waking up every day, living our own lives as though all we got to do is do what we want to do. But it says here in verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And that may seem crazy and it's supposed to be milkshake in order to think about and live the life that's for the future forever and ever. You have to think about what does God want you to do today? What is the purpose of his word for your life? If all you can think about is the bills, 
what you want to do and making your house look nicer, how you want to wash your car this Sunday, how you want to make your paycheck stretch, how you want to make sure you got your medication, how all these little natural things. You're not thinking about the forever and ever and ever amen. You're just thinking about the now. And this mortal body is going back to the dust. But that glorified body is either going to find itself in heaven or you're going to have that body that's going to live forever in hell. But it says here, I want you to say on verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now here's what we're going to talk about us as children. Children need guidance. And God is saying, I've left the Holy Spirit to give you guidance. So let's see what the Holy Spirit is going to do when it comes to those times in our lives that we don't know what to do. We are at a, our wit's end. We are even happy at times. And we have decisions to make even to bless others. Look what it says in verse 15. Here's the Abba Father and here's the Spirit. You're going to see them all working together here. It says, verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, Again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. There's the Father again. The Spirit himself, this is the Spirit, Holy Spirit, himself bears witness with our spirits that we're children of God. Now, if you're a child of God, then that means your Father. You already heard before that Lord Jesus Christ rose with all power. You've already seen that the we just saw... Matthew chapter 6 talked about, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. But we get into these little natural fits and situations and we just say, oh Lord, everything's going to fall apart. And God is saying, I'm your shepherd, I'm your father, I have, all, I have all power, and why do you think I would let anybody beat up on my kids? But look what it says here, verse 17. And if children then heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with, with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him. Here's his suffering. We're going to have some times. James 1 talked about it. We're going to have various trials. It said, count it all joy when we fall into various trials, but trials work patience because we are not patient with God. We don't want to wait. We want to do our own thing. It's all about us, us, us. And God says, I got to teach you some things. Children, I got my child, I got to teach you some things. And it says here, we indeed, we suffer with him, Christ. Remember the suffering from Psalms 22? He suffered. And he tells us that we are going to suffer with him. That we are going to profess Christ. And guess what? There's going to be suffering because Satan doesn't want us to hear about the good news of Christ. That we may also be glorified together. Now I want you to read verse 18. I told the friends and family members at sunrise yesterday something that I think all of us even outside of a assisted living or a nursing home or in our 80s 90s or wherever we are but listen to this cl closely for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us now verse 19 talks of I think if I were to have more time, I could explain something. But I wanted to explain something to them about the earnest expectation. I was telling them, and I tell you, imagine if your parent, your father or mother, said to you on a Sunday, there's a carnival in town, honey, and I'm going to take you on Friday night, and we're going to be able to, to ride that Ferris wheel and get cotton candy. Any child who loves to go to a carnival, if their parent makes that promise, they are going to think from Sunday night all the way Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, oh man, I can taste the cotton candy. I can feel the breeze on my face as I go up and I'm going to be on the Ferris wheel. I'm going to look down. I'm going to look at the people. I'm going to go and I'm going to play games and I'm going to tell my friends that my dad and my mom were going to the carnival. And they have such an expectant, an earnest expectation for Friday coming and the carnival. If a child can trust their father who makes a promise that they're going to the place that they're excited about and that child can get excited about it and want to tell people and want to just have that expectation and just see it and feel it and know it's coming even though it's not Friday. We have to trust that when God promises us that we're going to the place where he is that 
He says, there you will be also. There's an expectation, excitement. We got to get there. Even in the midst of whatever's going on with us, the spirit of God wants to excite our spirit within us. But don't take it from me. I want you to hear the last few verses. Verse 26 says, jumping down, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses. I tell you these things, not because I'm telling you that everybody's depressed. I don't believe that all saints are depressed, but something is going on that our church houses, our people are coming in and they're dragging in. Oh, I'm here at church. Can everybody pray? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glory to God. Yeah, yeah. Can we get it over? There is no passion or enthusiasm in our worship. When you people see us as Christian believers, oh, really? They can see somebody else in some cult have more enthusiasm than us who have that expectant knowledge that Christ is in heaven and that he's praying for us and that he's preparing a place for us. And it's not just about streets of gold and temporary treasures that we have here. It's about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, verse 26 says, For we do not know what we should pray for for." As we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, now listen with the Spirit. Now, He who searches the hearts, remember the hearts, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Remember where your treasure is, there is your heart. All these things about our heart. This is not the heart that beats like a coronary artery, this is something that is forever. This is the spirit within you that connects with the Holy Spirit. But that spirit of God is communicating with the spirit within the saints of God, the children of God. And look what it says here. But the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Those prayers that the Holy Spirit is providing, he's doing it based on what the Father, God, is telling him to pray. Remember the scripture from Matthew chapter 6, 8? For the Father knows what you have, the things that you have need of before you, he, you ask him. So he's telling the Spirit, pray for the will of God because he knows those things. You have to trust that because the Father knows, because he has the Spirit, praying with groanings that cannot be uttered by our words. Our words can't utter what the Holy Spirit is speaking for the Holy God. But here, it says here in verse 28, and we know all things, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. He has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for me. He has a purpose for faith. He has a purpose for our lives. And the Father knows that purpose. Satan understands that for the saints of God, he wants to derail us. He wants to confuse us. He wants to discombobulate whatever's going on in our emotions so that we can feel like we're frustrated, that we're defeated. And God is saying, no, 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 no. I am your shepherd. I am your father. I am the spirit of God that's here to comfort you. I'm getting the will of God and I'm praying and having groanings so that I can connect with that spirit, your heart. Now look at what it says here. This is great word. You got to take the time to read God's word because it's the answer to what you're going through. It's the answer to what you are going through. And the word going through means you're not going to stay there. You're not going to be stagnant. But you have to do something to get off your posterior and read his word. Ask God to help you understand his word and the spirit will help you. It says here, verse 29, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, I wanted to share this last bit with you of the scripture. You have to read all of Romans chapter 8 because it's so powerful. I gotta, I gotta read this part because it just doesn't make sense if I don't read it. Verse 31, I gotta read this. When they, sh it says, what then shall we say to these things? Again, those things, remember these things that he said he knew 
what things we need before we ask these things. If God is for us, who can be against us? When you go through these struggles, these storms, and Jesus is in the boat, all of this is telling you Jesus is in the boat. Every kind of way, Jesus is in the boat. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And he says, that, here's the Father. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Here again is these things. Freely gives us Jesus. Freely gives us the things that he knows that we have need of before we even ask him. And they're not temporary treasures. They're his peace. They're his compassion. They're his deliverance. They're his direction. They're his everything that he has is truth. You have to understand that the things that God has given us are not things that are going to uh, uh, end at this natural life. They're going to go on forever. They're going to go on forever. And you take them from 20 to 30 years, to 40 years, to 50 years, to 90 years, to 100 years, to 120 years. And then with the, the breath of life for this life, and you go into eternity, you get to keep on having the Spirit of God and His wisdom and his power, and his glory, and his honor, and his mercy, and truth, keep on going. But I wanted to share in the last moments, no matter what is going on in your life, and this is me, I speak to me, I, speak, I teach to me first. The word of God teaches us in, in chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, that no matter what is going on in your life, the whole list in 38 and 39 is saying, there's nothing that you can think of that is going to separate you from the love of God. And I keep repeating that because Satan keeps saying, oh, you are a liar. Oh, you are infidel, which means that you, you do sinful things. Oh, you are an adulterer. Oh, you are a fornicator. Oh, you are a homosexual. Oh, you are a drug addict. Oh, you are a robber. Oh, you are a criminal. Oh, you are this. Oh, you are that. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. There is nobody left out of all. But what we have to understand is that God is saying, seek him, repent, believe his word, believe that his son is the one true way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the father except through the son. But look what, what Satan lies to us. When mama dies, when spouse dies, when all these people die, life and death things happen, we just fall apart. But look at what it says here. The first thing he says out of verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life. Those are the first two on the list because all of us are afraid. Mama going to die. Daddy going to die. My husband going to die. My brother's going to die. My neighbor's going to die. My best friend's going to die. I'm going to die. God is telling us, you are fearing things that I have overcome. I am the, I am the life giver. I'm the resurrection and the life. I have overcome death. You don't have to fear death because it's a new chapter starting in eternity. He's trying to tell us nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Not a height, not a depth, nothing created. He's going through this entire list here. And he's just trying to say, you can be calm to know that the Lord, our Father, and his shepherd, who is his son, and the Holy Spirit, our comforter, they got us. They have us in the palm of their hands in the prayers that they are uttering for our behalf. We have to hold on to the truth of God's word. And when the hot tears come, we have to say, God is with me. He's my caregiver. He cares for me. And Satan, you are a liar. And you're going to the pit of hell in the name of Jesus because they defeated you. You are a defeated foe. And no matter what happens in our lives, God is going to work it out. What does that scripture say? All things work together for good for those that love the Lord to those who are called according to his purpose. And I believe that many of us need to stand on his word and believe in his word and stop having the pity party and rise up and be passionate and expectant about the things of God that are to come. Glory to God in the highest. Thank you for joining us for Milkshake Monday. God willing, we'll see you next Monday.